As we prepare to hear God's word to us this morning, let us pray together. Holy God, we know that you are here with us because we have gathered in your name. Because you are here, help us to see well. Especially help us to see your living word, even Jesus our Lord. And in that, seeing to learn to follow him. This we ask in his name. Amen. Our lesson for this week is from Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. I want to give you just a little bit of context for that smaller section of scripture. Just preceding this section, Jesus has performed several miracles, one right after another, and the crowd has, has been amazed at him. But the Pharisees have dismissed what he has done as demonic. This is what they said, by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. Our text follows immediately upon that. Matthew 9, chapter, I mean, chapter 9, verses 35 to 40 to 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me ask you the same question that I asked the children. Not about what you want to be when you grow up, but but that other one. What do you think is the most important job in the world? What was the first thing that came to your mind? Someone said something. Parent. Parent. And that's, yeah, one of of the children thought of that one. I think that that's one of those really important jobs, isn't it? Um, Some people might think President of the United States. Pretty important job. Teacher, that was another one that I thought of. Uh, A a teacher in in our public schools, especially. Yeah, they have great influence on children. Uh, Emergency room, doctors and nurses. First responders, you know, firefighters and other first responders. Lots of possibilities as the most important job. There are lots of important jobs, uh, but those are among the possibilities. Some Christians seem to think that the most important kind of jobs, and I'm glad that none of you said this, but some, of, some Christians are, think that some of the most important jobs are those that, when I was growing up, were called full-time Christian service. You know, ministers and missionaries and evangelists whose whole lives are dedicated to doing the Lord's work, which meant working in the church, or bringing the gospel to people who have not heard it outside the church. Both Martin Luther and John Calvin, the fathers of the Protestant tradition, would remind us that all Christians have a sacred vocation, a sacred and holy calling. It isn't just those whose lives have been set aside for labor in the church who have a call from God. All Christians have such a call. No matter what career or job a Christian person has, of course, within the parameters of what is legal and moral and ethical, but whatever job a Christian person has, he or she is or ought to be doing the Lord's work in the world. All labor done to bring glory to God is significant and honored labor. Our gospel lesson for today gives us a context for that work that we do in the world, that that work that we do with Jesus as we go about our own labor. As I said in the introduction to the gospel text, 
Jesus, in this passage, has performed a number of miracles, healing people who were desperate for help. And the Pharisees have dismissed his work as demonic. Jesus does not even respond to that scandalous libel from them, but, but in our text, he simply continues doing the same work that he has been doing, going all over the country, preaching, and teaching and healing. Huge crowds are running after him and, and crushing in on him, hoping that he will give them something, anything that will make their lives more whole. And we are told that Jesus looked at all of those people and had compassion for them. That he felt, as one translator puts it, deeply sorry for them. And as another translator puts it, that his heart broke for them because they seemed as aimless and as helpless as sheep without a shepherd. Turning to his disciples who were with him, he switches the metaphor from sheep to a field full of wheat, but with no one to harvest it. He sees people who are eager for God's kingdom, eager for some sort of a connection with God, but not knowing where to look. Then Jesus asks his disciples to pray very specifically. And that specific prayer that he asks his disciples to pray is this, that the Lord of the harvest will send laborers into his harvest. You know, other than the Lord's Prayer, this is the only time in the Gospels that Jesus asks his disciples to pray for something in particular. Of course, if his disciples pray that prayer that laborers be sent into the harvest, the answer is going to come back to them pretty quickly probably unsettlingly quickly. The answer, you yourselves are those much needed laborers. You yourselves are called to bring in the harvest. If you pray for God to do some particular work in the world, chances are that you're going to find yourself all wrapped up in that work. We, too, are the disciples of Jesus. And what might this story say to us about our part in the ongoing work of Jesus in the world? Well, I think there are a couple of things that we can take away from this story as we reflect on the ways that, that our work or our vocation can also be the work of Jesus. First, we need to see the world as Jesus sees it. We need to develop eyes that are compassionate eyes, so that when we look around the world, whether we are at work or at school or at home, whether we're engaging in labor or recreation or in worship, we're training our eyes to perceive what Jesus would perceive. Notice, by the way, that in this story, Jesus did not wait for those in need to come to him. He went out looking for them. In a sense, he made himself see the condition of the people in his world, and he reached out to help them. I think it's sometimes hard for us here in the church to see the people that are outside our doors. And we may think, well... We're here every week, and anyone who has a need can just come. And in a way, that's true. It's, it's true for what we do here on, on Sunday mornings. But during the week, each one of us is the church in all of the places that we go. And in those places, we can begin to see 
as Jesus sees. And we can begin to do as Jesus does. I was talking with a retired school teacher the other day, and she told me about a little girl who had been in the very first class that she taught, her very first year of teaching. This little girl often came to school in clothing that did not fit her properly, often with bruises on her arms. And she came hungry because her alcoholic father drank up the family's money every week. And that teacher did what what I think a lot of teachers do. She made sure that 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 child's need was met. She made sure that that child got free lunches every day. Now that teacher could not change the family circumstances in which that little girl lived. But she could see her needs and do for her what she could do. She looked with compassionate eyes, not complacent eyes. And she helped. She saw what Jesus saw. Bob Pierce, the late founder of World Vision, which has provided care for thousands and thousands of children all around the world, once said, let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. Let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. Of course, what he is talking about is seeing the world as Jesus sees it and then acting compassionately toward everyone that we see. The second thing that I think we can take to heart from this story is that Jesus also calls us to pray that God will send laborers into all the hard and needy places of our world. And then, of course, to realize, as did the first disciples, that we are those laborers. Now, we obviously cannot be the laborers in all the places where there is need. But we can look around in our own small spheres and ask, where are the fields that are ready for harvest here? What can I do right here that will be part of God's great harvest of grace and mercy in the world? If Luther and Calvin were right that all Christians have a calling from God, a vocation that is holy, no matter what job or work or career they are engaged in, then the question we ask as we enter into our own tasks is this. How can I bring glory glory to God through what I am doing right here? We might pray, even as we pray for more laborers, that God will open our eyes to see the people and the situations that are part of our everyday lives and that we will see ways to do God's work as we do our own work. We have a friend who was in our our Maryland congregation who was a very successful insurance company executive. And he used to say, God has given me the gift of being able to make lots of money. And I have that gift so I can give away lots of money. And he and his wife have done that with great thought and with great generosity for as long as I have known them. If we think of our everyday work, as the field that has been given to us to harvest for God's kingdom. It transforms our ordinary and perhaps sometimes mundane jobs into spheres of praise and thanksgiving. Places where we can honor God by living out God's purposes for us and for the world. There's an old story that's told, and I'd be willing to bet that a number of you have already heard this story, but it's a good one, so I'm going to tell it again. But 
It's a story about a couple of stonemasons who were at work on the construction of a cathedral. And one of them was asked, what are you doing? To which he responded, well, I'm laying bricks. The second was asked the same question. He responded, I'm building a cathedral to the glory of God. Now the work that each one of those men did was only a small part of that whole project. For the first man, his work was simply the drudgery of laying one brick on top of another. For the second man, his work was part of something beautiful for God. Our Lord Jesus calls us into our ordinary lives to see there's something that we can do to further his kingdom. Something beautiful that we can do for his sake or for the sake of all those people he loves. We come to this table once a month to be nourished to be fed, as it were, on the body of Christ. We come to be fed so that we can be strengthened to go out and to be Christ's body in the world. So we can go out and help bring in God's harvest of grace and mercy and love and compassion. May our eyes be opened the breaking of this bread so that we will see as Jesus sees and then go out and do what he calls us to do.